Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. I've got a very interesting guest for you today. He's got a lot of monikers, man. I would say social media influencer, uh, maybe troll slayer. Uh, and I, I think a motivational speaker, I believe, is what you're becoming here because your Instagram is popping. Please welcome to the show, John Sarasani. John, how you doing, my friend? Hollywood Wade. What's up, man? I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be Chicago John today. How's that sound? There you go. Chicago John, Hollywood Wade. That's a pair right there. <laughs> Listen, man, you come across my Instagram, I'd say, I don't know, maybe four months ago. And right. I would I would watch your stuff and the videos and, you know, your energy level. It's just like there are certain people that you can feed off their energy. Number one guy that comes to mind to me, I'm a big football guy, as we'll get into. You got a little football in your background. Ray Lewis. You can yeah. feed off the that watching that dude fucking game prep coming out of the yep. tunnel. Like it got you hyped, ready to play football in your living room. I get a little yeah. bit of that feeling watching you on Instagram. Uh, let's start from the beginning here and we'll work our way to that. Tell us a little bit about you coming up early life. And then, you know, we'll get into what you're doing right now. Yeah, brother. I grew up in Schaumburg, Illinois, man. It's a suburb right outside of Chicago, very middle class. My dad was a high school gym teacher and a football coach. My mom was um, a park district preschool teacher. My brother followed in my dad's footsteps. My aunts and uncles are flight attendants, stewardesses, or um, union teamsters, uh, policemen, shit like that. And I was blessed because I was good at football to get into some prestigious universities and um, ended up graduating from Northwestern University, but started off at Notre Dame prior to that. And, you know, I was on that route to be a high school teacher, just like my dad was. And I decided, you know what, man, I, I think I want to get into the business world. I, you know, people are, I wasn't paying, I wasn't paying this tuition. I was on scholarship, but my classmates were. And, uh, you know, maybe I should do, um, you know, something different than, you know, teaching, not to take anything away from teaching, but maybe something that's a little bit, you know, more ROI from a financial standpoint for, for what that education is that I'm getting. Right. And I uh, decided to go into the work world, man, and got a job in insurance. And I was in it for a few damn years before I started looking around the damn room and realized, uh, wait a minute, man, this shit ain't rocket science. You got to just be competitive. You got to be detail oriented. You got to have a good work ethic. And as long as you're not a complete freaking moron, you could do some big things here, man. Mm -hmm. So I stopped drinking the corporate Kool-Aid. Everyone told me you're an idiot. This is a billion dollar industry. You're, you're, you're up and comer at this company called Arthur J. Gallagher, John. Why would you leave? You're an area vice president. You're only 27 years old. And I said, dude, because I could do this on my own, bro. This salary that they're giving us right now, it, it's a bribe, bro. And no. And the 45 and 50 year olds are like, John, no, man. You, you're not gonna be able to get any clients. If you go out on your own, you're not gonna be able to get any clients. You have to go downstream. I was selling employee benefit programs to corporations. Right. Like, well, the only employee you're gonna get is like the nail salon or the barber shop, man. You, you, you know, it's gonna be three three people that think you're handsome and you know, the, the, the beauty technicians are going to come, you know, buy insurance from you, but, but the big corporations ain't going to work with you, man. You got to have all these damn resources. Well, those resources, man, like the ones I had at Gallagher, shit, I don't even use those motherfucking resources. And when I wanted to bring in one of those subject matter experts to work on the damn account, I knew more than that damn person. And my follow-up was tighter. You get a BCC on emails, motherfuckers aren't replying back on my own damn team to my client's email that I'm blind carbon copied on. For three fucking days? Are you kidding? To let them know they're looking into it? Come on, bro. So yeah. I just decided to screw this shit, man. I'm going to go out on my own, and I'm going to stay in that middle market and above, and I'm going to do it. And I uh, started up from my kitchen table, bro. I was 27 years old. Fast forward, ended up selling that bitch uh, nine and a half years later into private equity. Owned 100% of the company for a few dozen million. And, and that's an interesting story of how you sold it and the deal with the stock. And I want to get into that, but... First, what derailed the the football career? I mean, because you, I mean, you got yeah. a pretty good sized fella. I mean, back then, the mold of a tight end, you fit perfect. Um, yeah. You know, what, what was kind of the derailment of that? Because all things considered, you look like you could have had a, a great career in that. Brother, I was just playing blackjack with Jason Kelsey from the, from the Eagles right before he announced his retirement. We were down there at the Super Bowl together, and uh, uh, Burt Kreischer had a blackjack tournament at at, uh, at Aria. There's like 20 of us there, me and Kelsey out of it kidding around i go dude if i played right now i'd have to play center and, and he goes why i go dude because tight ends like me dude i ran a fucking four seven when i when i was uh, this back in the 90s i ran a four seven he goes 
dude, I run a fucking four seven. He was center. I go, I go, I don't even know what position I'd be able to play in this day and age, bro. It's like, yeah. damn, dude, they're all freaking power forwards now, bro. But back then, you, you relied on your tight end to be able to freaking block. And uh, I was able to move bodies out of holes, dude. I was an extension of that offensive line. And I could go out for a pass and catch the ball, too, dude. So you're right. I was that prototype tight end for back then, brother. And um, Mark Bavaro esque type, Jeremy Shaw. Exactly. Like Mark precisely dude precisely and um you know it, well shocky was at the cutting edge of the new age i think when i was still playing well shocky was a few years younger than me but he was he was on that cusp of, of, of that generation starting kind of when things younger. started to shift you got your shockies your olsons and you know tony yeah. gonzalez's antonio gates they started to kind of change the landscape of what a tight end did well, when, when the fucking uh, Denver Broncos were calling Shannon Sharp a tight end and he's a damn receiver, it's like, wait a minute, dude, he's 220, bro. <laughs> tight end. No, no running backs running behind him, okay, bro? Yeah. <laughs> um, but what happened, though, dude, was um, I ended up leaving Notre Dame to go to Northwestern because I got into a little off-the-field controversy mm -hmm. and um, by my own, my own fault, man, and um, – Lou Holtz was the head coach at Notre Dame at the time. He had yep. just gotten fired slash, I, I put air quotes, gotten fired. He, he resigned, they said. Or I'm sorry, air quotes were resigned. Um, That's when he came and, back uh, to South Carolina he, after that. Yeah, he got the South Carolina J. I I think he took a year or two off, and then he got that South Carolina job and turned him around. And, uh, you know, then uh, you guys got, you guys ended his career at USC, bro, by uh, by that I fucking, think, uh, the bro. fight. Yeah, that, that big fall fall with right? Yeah, yep. That was terrible, man. Um, what, what is it? Yeah. Anyway, um, I was the first player under Bob Davey who took over for Notre Dame to, to to get into kind of trouble. And me and another teammate were out one night, and we got into a fight. It was something fucking stupid. We got into a fight with each other, and well, I won the fight. All right, but. The story around it wasn't like that glamorous, right? We're at four in the morning at an all night diner, and you know, you can imagine how that night's going with two 19 year olds that are freaking idiots, right? right. And, um, you know, fast forward, um, the head coach, Bob Davey, doesn't do shit about it or keep me in trouble because he kind of slaps me on the wrist and he goes, Don't be a dumbass, you know what I mean? Well, the kid is a linebacker, has a broken freaking nose, he was a walk on on the team um he's not getting any damn playing time spring football's going the kid's dad is in the stands watching our spring practice john sarasani is the starting tight end it's like that's the same john sarasani that punched my kid out his kid ain't getting no playing time so the dad goes around the football program and calls the school up the administration of the school and makes them aware of the situation now if you don't if you're not familiar with catholic institutions <laughs> Uh, nothing's bigger than, than their, their hierarchy and protocol. And that, that includes, yeah. unfortunately, football at Notre Dame. You wouldn't believe, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't think it, it I can tell you right now, it is bigger than football. Okay. Cause once that happened, it didn't matter what was going to go down. And I always kind of laugh because, you know, Bob Davey, the head coach was, thought he was doing me a favor, but he actually had to be doing me a disservice. Cause if he would have kicked me out of spring football practice, brother, and you know made an example out of me the kid's dad wouldn't have went to the school he right. didn't do any he wouldn't do anything he goes oh, fuck it. i probably deserve to get punched you know what i mean it was kind of like that kind of thing and the kid did deserve to get punched but whatever and, and and um anyway i ended up getting suspended for a semester from the school well sure enough that semester is in the fall which i was supposed to be the starting tight end um that fall so you can't start a tight end when you're you know fucking um <laughs> not enrolled in school <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna have so some more problems there to follow with that. Yeah. So so anyway, me me and my great wisdom, I was 20 years old at the time now. I you know, I know everything, bro. Forget you, Notre Dame. I'm not getting the system, I'm not coming back after the semester. I'm transferring all together. And Bob Davy told me, he goes, John, you transfer right now. You're gonna be in your 40s telling people, explain to people why the hell you transferred out of Notre Dame. If if you don't transfer and just stay here, sit out this season and come back. No one's ever going to ask you about this story two years from now. It'll never come up again. You transfer, you're going to be into your 40s, Santa. And Wade, I'm in my fucking 40s telling you the story right now. So he was absolutely right about that. 
But what he was wrong about is that I would be embarrassed about it because I'm not embarrassed about it at, at all. And it actually, in the long run, I think ended up helping me because the whole world, again, I was a starting tight end. Chicago Tribune has me on the cover, punched out of school, all that kind of shit. Notre Dame tight end, punched out, all this stuff. And there was no internet back then, right? right. And, um, you know, you really read the sports page. And um, <clears throat> everyone's expecting me to transfer to like Miami or Nebraska or Ohio State or Wisconsin was pretty good at the time. And um, Northwestern was very good at the time. I ended up going to Northwestern. Well, all the Notre Dame people were sitting there being like, well, he's a thug. Of course, he's going to go to like Miami and, you know, with the rest of the thugs, you know, it's kind of like the U in the 80s vibe was still kind of existing yeah. to a degree. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, dude, I, I ended up going to Northwestern. And it's like, how do you like me now? What are you going to say about me now? Because Northwestern's like, going to, you know, you're an East Coast guy. I'm like Duke or Vanderbilt, right, bro? So you ain't gonna talk shit about Northwestern, you know, you know what I mean? So I think um I think that was good. And and that's not why I chose that. I chose them because they had just won the Big Ten championship two years in a damn row and were 40 minutes from my house and my mom was sick and I was be a little closer to home. But um, you know, I I think as I look back retrospectively, um everything kind of went a certain way for, for a reason, dude. I ended up hurting my spine at Northwestern um, my senior year. I got a bad back injury that uh, I'm going to be fine as long as I don't keep playing football. And, um, you know, if I would have stayed at Notre Dame, I probably would never have gotten hurt, probably would have played in the NFL. But I don't know if that would have been a good thing for me in the long run, bro, because I got to tell you right now at Notre Dame, and for the day you walked onto that campus as a football player, you might as well be playing for the Dallas Cowboys. You are a freaking celebrity, dude. Okay. <laughs> and and to think I was gonna stay at Notre Dame, then go play in the NFL for I wasn't gonna be I wasn't gonna be Gronkowski or something. Maybe, maybe have a two or three year career, four years, whatever. Who who knows? And then to think I'm gonna turn around, minimum minimum salary minimum back then was 225 grand. Okay. Um, then to turn around and go get a job in an office or something. I'm gonna think my shit don't stink, dude. You you yeah. you really expect me after playing in Notre Dame and in the NFL, and I'm 28 years old, I'm gonna go get some office job. Um, you know, instead it's, you know, refreshing. You get to Northwestern, you find out, dude, uh, the grass ain't always greener. Yeah, they just won the Big Ten back to back, but shit, we opened up against Oklahoma at Soldier Field and the stadium was half full. Like people didn't give a shit. Like it wasn't like Notre Dame. And I, and I figured that out the fucking for first two minutes there i'm like oh whoa no one really gives a fuck about us and we had some stars on that team bro like stars and it just didn't have that fan base or that, that tradition that notre dame had and very few schools do that's not taking anything away from northwest but very right. few schools do but now i'm experiencing this hand and having this realization firsthand yeah. so it's a bit sobering right um and then and then i had something to prove bro when i when i found out i couldn't play um beyond college because my injury um, I had something to prove, dude, and I think I was just able to regenerate that passion towards um, towards success in the business world, bro. Yeah, and that's I think you can carry those tools. I tell everybody, you know, whether if you come from the street or whatever, you can always carry those tools and those things you learn to other avenues, yeah. you know, whatever you want to go right. into. You know, because a lot of yeah. times in the business world today, you know, people use street tactics in a business world. It's just really no different. You just less guns. Yeah. I just they can brother kill and, and i gotta tell you man two two p you know and this goes with your show right man you're you know you i know your story you know mm -hmm. life will throw you some curveballs man you're gonna get adversity in life dude and yes. and uh, you you experienced the last five damn years bro and and the, the adversity you faced was probably bigger than what most people are gonna face but but i gotta tell you there's people that had way worse than that right that right. went to jail for 12, 12 years before they got exonerated yep. right Yep. You know, and then there's the opposite end of the spectrum with someone like me at that time, dude, getting kicked out of Notre Dame, dude, and telling my mom who's in a wheelchair and my dad who was so fucking proud of me with Notre Dame shit all over the damn house that I got kicked out of fucking school, dude. Are you kidding me, bro? Like, like my world just ended, man. I just yeah. ended. And then, and then fast forward two more years, two years later, finding out I got this sitting in the damn doctor's office and then giving me my MRI results and saying I got a contusion to my spinal cord and you can't play football again or else you're going to end up in a wheelchair. It's like the world comes shattering again, man. And it's, it's, it's what are you going to do with this adversity? What are you, you going to do now with this information? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and then you got to build it back up. And, that's and that's right. seemingly what you did there. And um, 
with the bit, did you continue the business that you made after that? Was it still like insurance based business? What was that? Yeah, man. So, so I, I talk about uh, one of the concepts I talk about in my book. It, it, it's it's called you, you probably don't know I wrote a book, but I, I have a concept oh, I that I call paid, yeah. Okay, I have a concept called paid training, right. and and when when all these entrepreneurs out there in the world like watch Shark Tank, Mark Cuban, Damon, Lloyd Renner, they're going to applaud you. Oh, you had a business that failed, and you're eating ramen noodles out of your freaking car, and <laughs> I was like, fuck that shit, dude. Go get a job in corporate America, learn the trade, getting paid fucking six figures, learn everything while they're paying you, paid training, then pivot out, start your own business. And, and that's yeah. exactly what I did. I never in a million years would have been able to do what I did with my insurance company had I not worked for two others for the six years prior. No way. Not a chance. I, I would have been, I'd be peddling insurance, you know, like I said, to try to get nail salons saying, I can, I can save you a 4%. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's. That's petty shit. Anyone that knows the in an, if no anyone that knows the insurance game will know bigger shit. It's more like a consultative sale. You're actually consulting these people and you're viewed that way. You're not saying, hey, I could beat your rates. It's a totally different game. And there's so much more money once you're in that upper echelon. And I wouldn't even have known that world existed. I wouldn't even have known that I could compete in that space had I not worked at a company that focused in that area previously. And and when you sold it, you kind of had a little luck go with you um with the deals with the stock tell us a little bit about that i found that story very fascinating of how you did that yeah listen man so, so so the um a lot of times what i'll talk about often on my, my instagram is when i when i kind of promote entrepreneurship and, and the biggest mistake people make is they look at like okay how much would i make if i did this on my own versus how much i can make working for somebody else okay and they right. compare those two numbers and that's important to compare those two numbers okay absolutely but what they often what they often leave out is the wealth you're building along the way because you could one day sell that company as a w2 employee you have nothing to sell at the end of that road right. okay and and it could work out in a way that you could never dream of and and, and really that's what happened to me i get a call nine and a half years into my business and I get a private equity had entered the space for, for um, insurance, probably because they had squeezed every drop out of every other industry and hey, let's go, let's go get into the insurance game. Yeah. And um, this happened tw if it, 20 years earlier, this wouldn't happen for me 20 years from now, it probably wouldn't, have, wouldn't happen for me. I was in this right industry for, for private equity paying these big multiples. And, um, you know, they came in and I almost didn't even take the meeting, bro. I'm like, dude, you're no, I have a cash cow, dude. I like my job, bro. We got, we got fucking old school hip hop Fridays and then new school hip hop Mondays. And the fucking us old guys that are 35 would, you know, argue with the 25 year olds in the office, which is better, dude, Dr. Dre or Drake, you know what I mean? And, sh and shit like that. Like we had a really good fun environment, dude. And, um, and we killed it, bro. We fucking killed it. So I had no, uh, no interest in selling this company. And uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, bro. It was, it was so much money. And then what happens is you sign what's called a letter of intent, and it kind of outlines what the offer is. And I get the official letter of intent, and, and it's not a legal document, but it's bad taste if you sign that thing and then pull out, okay? You're like, yeah. okay, you sign this thing, you're moving forward, dude, unless there's something that comes up that's erroneous, you know what I mean? So I'm looking at this thing, I'm like, oh, Here's the gotcha. I got to work there for five years after I sell it. Okay, that kind of makes sense, though. They're, they're going to pay me for those five years, plus I get that pile of money. Okay. Oh, wait. I also got to take stock in the company that bought mine. And I could go 10% or up to 35%. And I'm like, okay, that's a gotcha. Oh, and they're also going to withhold 20% and pay it to me on the two-year anniversary. And that's that's contingent on all the revenue still being on the books. I see what you guys are doing, you little fuckers. So I, I just <laughs> so I take everything into consideration, and ultimately I decide to still do it. And I decided to take the high end of that stock piece at, at that thirty-five percent mark. And the reason I did that is because if I'm going to be stuck working there for five years, that salary they were going to give me ain't going to motivate me, dude. I, I'm not going to be motivated at all after that two-year mark when I get that 20% of the deal back, when the revenue is still there and I still got to work there for five years. Hey, let's make this fucking fun, dude. So, <laughs> so I take 35% of the deal in stock, okay? 
And in private equity, what's interesting is they're they're just selling it to each other in the space I was in. So these private this private equity firm is backing another company, and then that company is buying littler companies like mine, and then they're piling us up, buying us all for let's just make the numbers even. Say they're buying us for ten times multiple, okay? And then they're turning around and packaging us all together and selling it to another private equity firm for maybe 12 times multiple. And that's their arbitrage of money they get when they do this, okay? And um, that that's that's what the game was, bro. And um, you don't benefit off of that stock until there's what we call an event. And the event is when it transitions from one company, one private equity firm to another, okay? Well, it usually happens once every five to seven years, okay? That's kind of the standard. Well, I sold my company in April of 2015. In July of 2015, we get an email for just the stockholders that the company has been sold to another company. Now, it doesn't change anything for us operationally, but for the stock people, stockholders would change everything. Other people in my company have been sitting around waiting for this shit for six and a half years. My ass was waiting two months. It literally was April 30th to like Jan July 8th or something, whatever. Is that even two months? So, yeah, a little over two months. A little over, yeah. And uh, I see everyone going fucking nuts, high-fiving each other. And I'm like, does this make sense? I'm trying to call my lawyer. I'm like, no, that can't be right. Well, sure enough, it was, dude. And my stock price that I got in that, like, I think I got it in at like a buck, four, no, I think a buck 12 or some shit, ends up um, going up as part of the sale to $2.92. So I basically just tripled my 35% minority stock piece. So my minority stock piece was now worth more than the fucking deal itself, dude. If you yeah. look at it that way, okay? Now I had another important decision because when this happens, you have a, and this is pretty standard, you have a 30-day window as a shareholder to liquidate your stock because there was now an event. Now, you could only liquidate 50% of it though. You can only take half out because they don't want to have like, this thing where all their damn key employees yeah. disappear right into the sunset. You know what I mean? So we're going to take 50% out. Well, I'm looking at this shit. I go, what's changed for me in the last two months? I, I, I'm still, I, I still want the stock in there that I didn't, wasn't planning on this money. Nothing's really changed. Well, my accountants, my lawyer, like, dude, bird in the hands, more, more than two in a bush, blah, 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 blah. And listen, dude, I'm the businessman. They're fucking advisors, dude. And they think like lawyers and accountants. And that's one thing I learned in the sales process. You have people with very good intentions. But if you're the one that's actually built this motherfucker, why are you relying on anyone else for any decision, dude? Right. Take it what they can into consideration. Well, they're saying, dude, get out, man. You don't know what's going to happen. Get out. You, you know, you're not going to be able to liquidate again for until you leave there. I, I wasn't planning on doing that anyway. It's, it's four, four years and 10 months from now, right? Well, sure enough, I leave it all in. And that stock that had already tripled once, okay, all rolls into the next company. And at the four year, four and a half year mark, it flips again from one other private equity firm, from that private equity firm to another. It's now going to be my third private equity firm when I'm enrolled, when I'm, when I'm there. And it freaking tripled again. So my 35% tripled once. And then that multiple tripled again. And for those that are not math majors, that's 900% return on that stock, dude. Okay. And you that worked out good too, because had you drew out that money, you'd have had to pay a lot of taxes on the first. Bond. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that, and that's kind of one of the things, anybody that ever sells a company, it's an interesting dynamic. You, you get paid. <laughs> so when I sold that company, April 30th, I sold for X amount of dollars and then 35% of it was given to me in stock. But it was looked at. It's looked at it by the IRS that I got the whole amount of money, and then I used that money to buy thirty-five percent of stock, which isn't really exactly how it actually happens. Right. That's how the I. That's how the IRS looks at it. So because of that, that stock that I would have turned around and said, if I would have liquidated it two months later, okay, the IRS looks at that as short-term capital gains, which is the equivalent of regular income tax. Yeah. versus long-term capital gains tax, which it, everything else on that sale was, because I'd started the company in 2005, is, is taxed, I believe, at 20%, all right? So now I'm looking more at like, you know, 39.5% or whatever the fucking top bracket is versus 20%. So that was kind of like, 
that was when I when I heard that I was kind of a little bit on the fence. I was probably going to do it anyway, but then when I got that, I'm like, fuck that, dude. It was way too much money, dude. And I I, I had already not paid the IRS already for the sale. I sold <laughs> April thirtieth. I don't owe <laughs> I don't owe money on that fucking taxes. Until the next so, year. Exactly, dude. April fifteenth of the next damn year. Think about that, bro. So, so, so I got this big, large sum of money sitting in my bank account, where I know that a chunk, of, a chunk of that needs to go to the IRS. So I'm sitting there investing the damn money, telling my wealth manager, "Hey, dude, don't fuck this up because we're gonna need, we're gonna need a big chunk of that fucking yeah, next year." You're gonna come so calling we'll next year around April, so. Dude, seriously, bro. So, um, yeah, man, you know, I, I feel like I got a P I think two things, man. I got a PhD in, um, you know, just kind of a bunch of shit I didn't know anything about. And then I also think I'm the poster child for, for how a private equity, how selling out your company to private equity could, um, could work in your favor as, as the owner, because you hear horror stories oftentimes, dude, where they take deals in stock that are end up worthless and, all that shit and uh mine mine was quite the opposite so i kind of yeah. left i left the company a little bit sideways we had a little pissing match at the end there on some stuff but it's kind of just the company outgrew itself there they, they got so damn big it was it's kind of like i was like their 18th acquisition by the time i left i think they had like 150 or something so it was like man that's why the stock did so well but but uh you know it was kind of like you know it smelled you know, like but, fucking roses at the end of it though. i mean you were that was a big hit right well, I sure did, man. And and um, I also made money, too, because the new stock certificate at the end didn't buy you out of the stock on your last day of employment, they, they ch which was the language in the previous stock certificates. The new stock certificate with the new private equity firm would buy you out in what they call um, tranches, and uh, which is another word. Part of my PhD in this shit, by the way, I learned what a tranche was. Um, and uh, if I'm even saying that right, there's probably some financial guys being like, what a fucking moron this guy is. Uh, and, and it would be 100% on the last day you worked at fair market value of the stock. So, so here I really tripled that because here's how it worked. They paid me out 40% that day. 12 months later, another 30%. And 12 months after that, another 30%. However, with that, they were revaluating the stock every 90 days. So instead of the stock tripling on that final day and the other two examples, it was incrementally going up. Uh, you know what I mean? And I had like, I mean, because of that dynamic of what I just said, I made like an extra like over $10 million because of that. It's so like, it was fucking dang. like, like I'd get these emails like once I was, I'm sitting there fucking doing nothing, like fucking hanging out in Cabo with my kids. Like an email, oh, stock price went up, you know, 18 cents on our, you know, April 1st update. And I'm like looking at it. It's like, hey guys, I made an extra 900 grand today doing fucking jack shit for this company I worked at two years ago. Wow. <laughs> so when you hit that, though, I mean, like some people, I think might just be like, all right, fuck it. I made it. It's kickback time. Some people can, you know, keep their foot on the gas. What was your kind of thinking and plan at that point i mean obviously like you said you're on vacation with your kids you're gonna you're gonna enjoy the fruits of your labor but where did you what what was it that decided you to keep going and what avenues did you want to pursue well a couple of things happened I, I realized how fortunate i was because i one of the things i could have done is gotten back into the insurance game rather easily and kind of rinsed and repeated this whole damn thing right. i don't know if it would have worked, worked out from a stock perspective quite as well but i definitely could have Built the clients up, turned around and sold it. I got two kids, man. And they're both, you know, at, at the time, they're 21 and 16 now, but at the time they were younger. Yeah. One of them looks to be a pretty good blackjack player you got coming up there. I watched that live. Yeah, man. yeah man, they're both good. They're both good. But I, uh, dude, I, I looked at life differently, man. You know, I, I, um, I don't want to be too like specific with numbers, but, but, but just let's say you were worth, you know, say, say somebody was worth six dollars, and 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 you you say, hey, if you do this the next ten years, you're gonna end up being worth nine dollars, and and you're in your forties now, and your kids are growing up, and you know, to me, my life changes with with that difference in net worth. Nothing was really gonna change in my life. Now, if you were to tell me, hey, you have a chance to be a billionaire or some shit, but like for me to make an extra, you know couple well i don't want to say it but like if you make an extra decent amount of money more 
even if it would have like raised my net worth a certain amount from a percentage standpoint, it wasn't going to like change anything, dude. There's nothing to, I don't fucking waste money on cars. I'm not into that, dude. I have a hundred thousand dollar Escalade. That's fucking great, bro. And I fly fucking first class. That's perfect for me. I don't want to get in private jets. I'm actually claustrophobic. I, I said a casino fucking trying to fly me out in a G5 to uh, San Francisco. He just invited me. I go, dude, send me a picture of the plane. I go, dude, it's a G5. I go, well, okay, I need to see it. I'm looking at the six foot two interior. I go, how many people are going to be on there? Because there's more than four people. I'm not getting on it. Like, like literally. Like, so, so I'm not missing out on anything, dude. And, right. you know, I do, I do nice vacations. I got a couple. You know, I got a couple houses that I really like, and um, you know, that, that's that's how I spend my money. So I, I don't, I, nothing really would have changed in my life, I don't think, and that, that's kind of why I chose not to do that. But, but to your original question, I wanted to do something. So, um, the wheels kind of fell off initially. It's December of 2019. I uh, was my last day worked. Um, I was 42 years old, and um, you know luckily I had my kids, but like, dude, Vegas, Bahamas, like literally wheels fell off a little bit, dude. And, um, then COVID hits in March of, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it, and if we're going to just be a hundred percent accurate here, they're already falling off because the last couple of years on that employment contract there, it was like, dude, fucking dead man walking. I go, this fucking yeah. sucks. <laughs> like, like you hear that story it all starts like hey let's be on committees let's volunteer and then and then something goes sideways and it's like get me the fuck out of here but um yeah so uh i i, I decided during covid that uh yeah i actually got a swimming pool put in my house covid was kind of fun my house was like the destination for everyone to come over to the pool you but, got a fucking uh, waterfall in there <laughs> dude it's fucking great man it's fucking great but I, uh, no, dude, I, I think I, I just kind of like needed to do something. And I started fucking around with angel investing in early stage venture capital, which is kind of fun. But I was like, why not do it with like cool stuff? Things I think is interesting, you know, and I, you know, you, Wade, you ever want to make some friends? Go put, go put on your uh, LinkedIn, change your LinkedIn to, to, to a venture capitalist or angel investor. You will have a ton of fucking new friends, like rather quickly. I'm telling you, bro. <laughs> and, um, so what somebody a peripheral person that knew me saw it on my linkedin he knew about a company aaron Rodgers, what was involved in he knew i played football at notre dame and you got all these people out there that like want to be relevant so he thought he'd make this match of introducing us and before i knew it i was fucking hanging out with all these guys out in la and uh dude it, it, like I'm a paranoid motherfucker, dude. And I was like, dude, it's all a setup, dude. I'm like out there and like fucking Zach Efron's hanging out with us and shit like that. I'm like, all right, wow. dude, they're paying him. To, I know they're paying him to do that because they want my money. And like it ends up not being the case at all. There was a little bit of that, but you end up getting in these fucking circles and you find out that these fucking celebrities, bro, they want to be around good business people just as much as we think it's cool to be around them. Like, yeah. like literally especially athletes at least the ones i encounter and the reason it's the ones i encounter is because they're in that room for a fucking reason they have an interest in that now there's probably this whole other subgroup of people that don't give a fuck about me <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. but the, the ones that the ones that are in those same rooms as me um um do so I, that was kind of cool you know i'm just some fucking single dad in the suburbs and selling insurance and you know i got two you know my daughter's a junior in high school and i'm fucking going to la now and doing cool shit and all of a sudden it was, you know it's kind of fun so you know, over time, that kind of morphed into, you know, talking about it a little bit on social media, giving business advice. And um, ultimately, that turned into this whole 2000% raise concept that I that I uh, that I talk about that I think has made my page so popular. Oh, yeah, that and um, well, you're a heavy gambler. I mean, had you always liked to gamble to that kind of get yeah. stay yeah. on 16? <laughs> I like that. So the gambling is a function, bro. So, so what I realized was as, as the social media got more and more popular, I would, um, it's almost a full circle shit, right? So like when you're posting you out with your friends or your kids or, or shit like that early on, like, okay, that's cool. But like random people aren't going to start following you if, if right. that's the kind of stuff you're posting. So right. business advice, business acumen, blah, 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 that kind of build a following, build a following. Well, over time, people start to feel like they know you. And then I sneak in every once in a while a picture of my kids on my story or a picture of me doing, you know, something fun on a boat or whatever the fuck. 
and I start seeing good reaction from that. Right. So one day, dude, I'm fucking like fucked up at uh, the Venetian in Las Vegas. And uh, the person I was with wanted to gamble in the general population area, dude. I, I'm in high limit. I go out to Gen Pop, dude. And these motherfuckers, bro, I had a gamble in Gen Pop on the Vegas Strip. <clears throat> like, a, like, maybe never. I, maybe when I was fucking a kid. I don't know, fucking remember ever doing it. And um, they're fucking using automatic shufflers. They don't, no, no, I'm sorry. They're not even using sh automatic shufflers. This is like a never ending shoe. After the cards come out, they just put it back in the back and it's just yeah. continuously shuffling. And, and, and then when you get blackjack, they fucking don't pay three to two odds. They pay six to five. And you can't just change the rules of the fucking game, dude. <laughs> so I, I pick up my phone. It's like two in the morning. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I would probably want to, I kind of had an okay following at this time, but, but uh and I uh, listen. I'm I'm clearly clearly obliterated. And I go. I'm, I'm out here in general population gambling with the peasants. <laughs> and and you can't win in general population. And I go. There's no beginning. There's no end. And I look into the phone and I go. You can't fucking win. <laughs> and it goes fucking viral. Largely, probably, because I fucking said peasants. And I wasn't meaning, yeah. like, because of the amount they were gambling. I was, my meaning and my real followers understood this because they know I'm a nice guy. My real followers knew I was saying the casino treats you like a fucking peasant out there. Yeah. They, a peasant that's just going to go with anything, dude. Like, hey, we're going to change the rules of blackjack. It's going to be not in your favor. And you're still going to sit here and fucking play. That's peasant behavior, dude. Okay. That would not happen in high limit and not tolerated there. All right, bro. So, you know, that, that was my point. But, you know, my followers now are defending my ass in the comments. Other people are like, you arrogant prick, blah, 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 blah. Other people are just saying I'm fucking full of shit. And dealers are coming in. I, you probably don't tip, you asshole. Like, it, it just went fucking. <laughs> it but went that's viral. what you want, though, with this kind of shit, though. That's what you need. You need that back and forth from the commenters, and that drives it through the fucking Yeah. Room. Ain't it? Well, exactly, exactly. And I was, I've never posted with that in mind, to be honest with you. It's just happened. And, and I think that's one of the reasons people really like my page because it's so real and, and yeah. genuine. It's people are like, hey, who do you use as a social media consultant? I go, motherfucker, have you looked at my page? Yeah, you can tell it's <laughs> you. It's just you. <laughs> there, was not, there was nothing to suggest that a, a paid professional did any of this. Yeah, I was like, um, you're walking through a casino, walking down the street, in a car, whatever. Yeah, that's that's precisely the case. But I, I got to tell you, though, so what I learned, though, from from that post and just ones like it was that there was this heavy interest in, in, in the lifestyle piece of things. And, um, you know, my page had really blown up when I really started leaning into the entrepreneurship stuff because I did like like business acumen. But I, that when I started saying, fuck the W2 lifestyle, be an entrepreneur, corporate America is going to fuck you. When I started saying that, it, it started getting popular. Okay, and then it was, it was trucking away, trucking away. But when I leaned into this gambling, holy shit, bro. Dude, people, bro, I can't walk through a fucking casino, dude. Any casino in the world. Any of the people just come up to me, dude, pictures and shit, dude. Like, I, I feel like I'm, uh, I don't know, I feel like I'm fucking John Sarasani, that guy from Instagram. <laughs> that's precisely who you are, John. <laughs> And that's I think that's not the casino video. One of the casino videos that you did is probably one of the first ones I've seen. And then I just mm -hmm. I start, you know, flicking through, go to the profile, click through, click through. And I'm like, I love this dude. And I'm reading the comments yeah. and I'm like, a lot of people hate this guy, but I fucking love it. <laughs> and what I was found very amusing was you will blast publicly the haters. Like they'll come on there and I know exactly what you, they're always in there. Oh, this guy's an ass. So I bet he don't, like you said, don't tip or whatever. And you'll post yeah. your picture up with a, a funny little caption or something. And I mean, yeah. it just obliterated him. And I'm like, he's took the one thing that the haters, I call them haters, they help the algorithm. And then not only that, you take that and you blast it and create more buzz. So you're doubling down on the haters is what you do. Bro, I'll, I'll do like, <laughs> I just do like funny shit. Bro, yeah. my stories, I, I usually do it on my stories. Every once in a while, I'll do a reel. But, like, usually it's a story blast on the hater, bro. And, and you know, I take whatever picture I can find that's funny on their profile. I'll put them on my story. 
and then I'll pull whatever they said. I'll screenshot whatever they said, put it over their head, and then draw little cartoon lines around it, like like how it's coming out of their mouth. Yeah. And it'll say whatever they said. And a lot of times it's just something fucking mean spirited, dude. Like yeah. like people will be like, look at this fucking guy. He looks like he's on steroids. This is what cocaine looks like, kids. Or or <laughs> oh, <laughs> the best. Of, I don't get this as much anymore because people know now that I'll blast them. But a lot of people say, oh great, I'm one of the <laughs> Because <laughs> usually people are laughing because they're what they say about me is usually kind of funny too. We'll say, <laughs> now I've seen everything. A motivational speaker with a lisp. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so whatever I come back at him with is like then warranted, right? So the other day yeah. there's this guy like, and I'll just play like ridiculous shit, dude. So this guy's like holding his dog, and I have what he said, and then I make a little fucking thing coming out of the dog's mouth. And the dog's like, you know, this guy makes me like peanut butter off his balls. Arf. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell you, bro. I Honestly, dude, I'm seeing other people starting to do it now, dude. I, I, there, oh, I there's know. two. Bro, there, there's three things out there that I'm seeing catch on. And these were not intentional, dude. I call people that have normal jobs W tours. Okay, I'm hearing more and more people calling each other W tours now. Not that I made that up. But I kind of did. No one, no one says that. Now they are. Um, yeah. Hearing a lot of people say Gen Pop now. A lot of people are calling things Gen Pop. I think that was those around, but I think I've really kind of brought it to the forefront. And um, then um, the uh, the haters and shit. The hate, the blasting the haters. I'm seeing people do that. Yeah. Well, yeah. we talked a little off air. We have a, a guy that we mutually know. His name is Gene Barello, and yeah, I've had him on my show a couple of times. And one of the first shows that we had on, it had more haters in the comments. But I looked and I compared that like, really, you don't even, I think in this business, you don't want a bunch of people just congratulate. The haters is what drives the algorithm because they share, somebody might like it, say, oh, that's a cool video. And they might like it and then they leave. But the haters, they share it to this guy. Do you see what this fucking guy just said? And then that guy sends it to two of his buddies. Do you see what yeah. this fucking guy just said? The haters help you more than the people that like it, to be quite honest. And I'm reading Dude. this. All these fucking comments are just negative, negative, negative. And I, I told him, I was like, I said, this thing is doing something here. And it kept rising mm -hmm. up and rising up. And now it's like my most popular video. And that's when it kind of clicked to me is like the haters are really a benefit. And I think you've realized that to a point. And I think a lot of people, when you stop trying to please the masses and start doing really what you want to do and you yeah. can grow something. And that's one reason when I had on my show, I was like, the one thing that I can say that I'm going to do because of my show, I don't, I'm not going to have anybody on that I don't find interesting. And I can right do it because it's my show. I'm not, you know, owned by anybody. I'm a one man show. I do all the shit myself, all the editing, yep. everything. So if I don't find you interesting, I'm just not going to have you. It doesn't mean I don't like you. I just, I'm not going to have right. you if I don't find you interesting to talk to. That's right. That's right, man. Yeah, I think you nailed it, dude. I think you nailed it. And what, what's, what's interesting about the whole hater thing is that how, People have like gotten behind that so hard. Like me coming at these haters, dude. It's like, yeah, fuck those guys, dude. No, dude, you're the only influencer that calls these fuckers out. Fuck these keyboard warriors, dude. Fuck them. And then they'll cross over with like different shit, dude. It like cross pollinates, dude. Like mm -hmm. some fucking twenty-two year old kid, dude, is at the fucking casino the other night. Sends me a fucking long ass DM at five a.m. Right. And just telling me how he was down and how he came back and it reminded him of this video. And dude, I thought I was you. I came all the way back. And then at the end of it, he writes, fuck the haters. <laughs> haters have nothing. The fucking the haters have nothing to do with my blackjack videos. They're not even associated. But it's like they fucking feel the whole thing, dude. And people get like excited, bro. They like want to go. Let's fucking go, dude. You know? Well, wasn't it uh Bert Kreishner that um he's he was on one of the big podcasts and he was talking about you and that's what he was saying he's like people talk shit and he'll just fucking blast them right there in the stories and just fucking obliterate them and I mean I I know that drove yeah. a lot of traffic there just to see that it's, it's hilarious I get a kick out of it brother I'm gonna tell you right now Bert Kreischer has been such a, a, a feather in my cap as a supporter totally organic he just started following me one day and then we we're um I didn't follow him I didn't follow him back and then we were in uh. Tampa Hard Rock, Tampa Bay Hard Rock at the same time. And one of our mutual followers messaged me and said, dude, Bert's at the same hotel as you right now. I DM Bert. We had never spoken a word together. He goes, yeah, dude, fucking love your shit, bro. And I was having one of my dinners with other people that were there to see me and shit. And 
Dude, like, hey, I want to go to Sarah Sonny's dinner. It's fucking, you never know what's going to happen. Burt Kreischer fucking shows up. And me and him end up hanging out till three in the damn morning. But, um, you awesome. know, it, it, yeah, yeah. So him and I have become friends now. And and very recently, because he just had a show in Chicago and he had me uh, backstage at it. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I just kind of made an off-the-cuff comment, just kind of kiddingly, really. But I'm like, dude, I got to start watching what I post now because this shit's really fucking blown up now, dude. Like, blown up, dude. And I got, like, celebrity celebrities follow me, too. Not just Bert. Like, Jimmy yeah. Kimmel follows me, dude. Nick Cannon follows me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned that to Bert. I got like, I got to start paying attention when I post a little bit. I don't want to lose these big followers. He goes, fuck that, dude. You got the biggest celebrities in the world following you right now. They might not. He goes, John, I'm going to tell you right fucking now. They might not actually press the follow button. But all of these people know who the fuck you are. And, and he yeah. was referring to like the Joe Rogans of the world. He goes, I guarantee you, these people already know who the fuck you are. Yeah. Don't stop doing anything you've been doing. What, 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 what had, what did you expect to be in this spot? Was this your plan? I go, no, I never it. expected it. It's by you not paying attention to that shit. One yeah. of them fucking unfollows you. Fuck it. Who cares? And, and, and I got to tell you, man. Like when Nick Cannon started fucking following me, dude, I have a picture of Nick Cannon and my daughter up downstairs in my fucking basement when my daughter was six years old, dude. All right. Then I see Nick Cannon starts following me. <laughs> I don't even know he's on Instagram. I mean, I'm sure I would have assumed he was, but nothing to do with each other, dude. Right. So I'm like, I'm like, dude, this is so fucking lame of me. But I made a fucking reel. <laughs> I seen it. I seen it. <laughs> dude, I made a reel about him following me. <laughs> and then I fucking tagged him. <laughs> <laughs> it was more just the kind of flex to the haters, but but it was really like, hey man, listen, you know, we've arrived. And I said, hey, how cool is fucking this? And I said, hey, and my daughter was turning 21 like the next day. So I made the real about so what we what you didn't know is here's my daughter and Nick in, and today he started following me. Hey Nick, just like you did 15 years ago, you made me the coolest dad in the world. Okay, because yeah. I had taken her to see him when she was six. Okay. Dude, I gotta fucking tag him. And I'm like, ah, that's kind of gay, dude. I look, or kind of lame. I, I like literally screenshotted and <laughs> Nick Cannon followed you. Follow back. I literally screenshot and put it on the screen. I'm like, dude, am I, am I pressing buttons here? Uh, that's kind of, dude. He fucking not only didn't unfollow me, he fucking comments on the fucking real dude, saying, bro, I gotta get a picture of me and you up on my wall, pal. <laughs> uh, you know, but dude. So sometimes, it, it, like, and it's like, why censor yourself, dude? If I. I'll take my shit down, dude. I, I know some of my shit's not funny sometimes, or it just doesn't hit right, or it just doesn't land, dude. I don't have any professional training. I'm telling you right, right fucking now, I had, I had two reels today that I fucking took down. And sometimes I take them down prematurely. <laughs> you know, right. It's not funny. Why is there like no views and no one's commenting? Um, I try not to do that very often, but you know, I actually had, um, do you know Bob Mennery? Do you know who that is? Yeah, yeah. So me and him fucked around with each other a bit back when I was a lot smaller uh, back then. But, like, we still fuck I mean, he's still my friend. But we, he gave me some advice. He goes, dude, just fucking take this shit down, dude. If it's, if it's, people don't like it, you were wrong. Just take it down. Trust me. <laughs> like, so, his couch, his couch gave you pink eye, too, didn't it? What's that? I said his couch gave you pink eye, too, didn't it? Yeah. No, it was my couch that he fucking <laughs> stayed at my house and wouldn't fucking leave, dude. He was at my house for two months. I go, bro, I said he could stay a weekend, pal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you ever, see that movie? you ever see that movie with Bill Murray? What about Bob? Oh, yeah, remember yeah, like what about Bob? yeah, you remember Bob? the guy wouldn't leave, yeah, That's Richard Dreyfus. Like, hey, uh, yeah. I fucking just shows up, <laughs> Bob. I come back to my place in LA. Oh, you're still there, interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and you want to know the backstory of that movie? Was they fucking hated each other, like, it, oh, outside really? of, yeah, he oh, Bill, really? like, totally. Just he he's one of the I don't think he does it all the time, but in that one, like he stayed in character even off camera, and so it was driving Richard Dreyfus fucking nuts. And I think really? the time, they even had like a full blown fist fight at some point in time in that movie because he was. Well, dude, I'm just glad you great. like the reference, man. You must be somewhat around my age then, because I, I I used to tell that story back when Bob was doing. A lot of people didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. So no, I I loved. I watch. I don't know what it was about it. I did watch that movie all the time. It was just the way he just innocently aggravated the shit out of Richard Dreyfus. You know, he didn't mean yeah. to, but he just did. And it was. I'm 40, so a lot of the okay. things that you were into, like I, I heard you talk about one podcast, the uh, Jamie Kennedy experiment, because you actually had a comedy show yourself, a little prank show yourself. Yeah, in high school, I did that, man. But, but, you know, as a kid, bro, like, when you're as good as I was, 
or just really any talent, I guess. But like, if you're the caliber of an athlete where you're going to go play football at Division One, it kind of dominates everything else in life. You know right. what I mean? And, and you know, really just kind of, you know. And I had a public access TV show, and I was on that forefront, bro. I was doing the dude, fucking Tom Green, fuck that dude. I was doing that shit three years earlier, bro. And Schomburg, Schomburg, fucking public access, 1993, dude. Look that shit up, bro. Tom Green stole my material. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the con the concept the concept yeah. was there, dude. It was the same kind of idea, but you know, we only did like three episodes because you know, only got a fucking you know, where, where's your ROI at? It wasn't yeah. it didn't seem like it was that bad. It was playing tight on on you know Notre Dame, but uh, yeah, you yeah, man. Hey, what part of South Carolina are you in? I'm in Charleston. Bert's actually coming here on his comedy tour. Is he okay? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what, man. I don't know if you, you probably weren't going to ask me this, but there's a price to this shit on social media too, man. I, I, um, I had made all my money working in um, with colleges and universities. I had a niche working with universities, and that's kind of how I built my insurance business. And after I was done and sold my company and, and into retirement, I uh, some of my former clients had asked me to participate by being on their board of uh, trustees, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's a huge, huge, huge um, honor to be a board yeah. of trustee. I mean, you're, you're higher than the president of the university if you're on that board of trustees. And anyway, one of them that I had done that for was a, a small private college in South Carolina, um, right outside of Florence. I don't know if you ever heard of Coker University. Dude, I grew up in Darlington, South Carolina, Coker no College. Way. Oh, yeah, that's where I grew up was in Darlington. There you go, man. There you go. But, um, you know, they... Uh, I, I actually, I just knew what direction I was going with my social media and I just knew it wasn't going to be a good look for me to right. kind of right. be talking about the stuff I'm talking about and sit on the university's board. I, and I don't want the kind of that weighing on me. There's a right. couple of things I was doing. I was doing, I was on the board of trustees for a, a couple of colleges and I stepped down. Um, and then I was also a high school, I volunteered as a high school um, football coach too and kind of had to stop doing that too. And, you know, these were things I was passionate about, man. So it's like, you know, you know, everyone thinks it's all, all fun and games and shit and, and it is but i did get up some if you would have told me 10 years ago hey john do you want to fucking post on instagram all day or do you want to be on the board of trustees of one of these universities that you look up to a million yeah. years i wouldn't yeah. have uh wouldn't have said i would be picking the instagram thing over it but i feel like that's where i'm making a bigger impact bro I, you know when i sit on those boards of trustees and not so much with a high school football coach because i do think i'd bring in something pretty unique there there but 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 as far as a trustee of these universities i'd sit in these meetings like kind of looking at it like i like being here i could do a good job but some, someone else can too you know what i mean what, what kind of really impact am i leaving what kind of legacy am i really leaving here that actually makes a difference right. and and i felt like my social media is um a way to impact the world you know more relevantly yeah and it really does and sometimes you have to make those sacrifices like for instance i coach seven on seven football like when I got in my trouble, one of the only times they let me leave the house outside of like work and church and doctor's visits, the normal stuff was for activities for my son. And so he mm. was playing football. And so obviously I'm going to every practice. I'm going to every game. One of the guys, yep. he, knew me, he knew like me, me, he knew that, you know, none of that shit was true. So he's like, you want to coach? And I'm like, fuck yeah, yeah well, I'm here every day. So I might as well. And we done mm. that. That grew into me coaching seven on seven and i've been doing it for about three or four years straight won a few championships i met guys like clinton portis playing in big uh tournaments and stuff a lot of the panther players we have our nationals up in rock hill next to charlotte so a lot of panther players show up but then here recently i was doing a lot of traveling with the podcast and i wasn't able to dedicate the time that mm. those boys deserve so i took a step back and let another guy kind of run it but i still follow up with them when i can but you do have to kind of make sacrifices and certain things yep. that, you know you don't want i mean i've interviewed some porn stars on here and stuff like that so i mean you know i always talking to porn stars on wednesday but he's coaching our kids on saturday you know so i decided <laughs> to kind of distance from that a little bit but the fucking kids love it they'll see it it's like yeah. you talking to the porn star? i'm like yeah don't tell your mom that yeah well that's where it gets so touchy man when it's right. anything to do with kids you know what i mean anything yeah. to do with kids that you're doing there's that just yeah, it's just it's touchy. It's touchy, dude. But you, you know, because all these administrators and governing bodies, they're all you know, they're all angels, right? They're all they're all oh, you know, yeah. freaking yeah. choir yeah, boys. Never, never done so, nothing wrong. Now speaking right. of Gene Barello, um, he's a former banana guy. Uh, he was yep. in the life. If you Google your name, 
there's another John Sarasani that, that pops up. I know, I know you don't speak a lot about this, but can you get a touch on it just a little bit for us? So if you Google John Sarasani and you got to, you got to scroll a couple pages that down now, cause this John Sarasani has become very popular, yeah. but yeah. Back in the early stages of Google, before there was even Google, when you would still go to like Yahoo for your search engine, um, I would have I was the one that you'd have to scroll to find. Yeah. So <clears throat> John Sarasani is a hitman, allegedly, for the Bonanno crime family. And his name it was he goes by Booby Sarasani. And his legacy, actually, and I've gotten to people that are lawyers that have actually DM'd me this. Are you related to the John Booby Sarasani? Because they actually teach about him in law school. And what's unique about him is that the movie Donnie Brasco, all right, Sony Pictures puts it on. And there was, it's based on the book, but they changed the names in the movie, okay? Well, there was a character that was obviously based on John Booby Sarasani, mm -hmm. okay? And they made him out to be a murderer in the movie Donnie Brasco. He was never convicted of that crime. So he sues Sony Picture for defamation and libel. Okay. Now here's why it's in the history, or here's why it's taught in law. Okay. Because there's actually a case study on this. All right. He was right. They did depict him as a murderer. They shouldn't have. You have a good case, the judge said. However, your reputation was so bad anyway. It can't be defamed any further. So, <laughs> so your case is dismissed. Wow. <laughs> so a New Jersey judge or a New York judge actually ruled that. And it's it's now case case uh you know, case law or whatever the fuck it's called. That's crazy. And I, yeah. I heard you talk about this, and I'll speak on this for a second too. You know, things that you and I would find like great, like one of the biggest guests, in my opinion, that I had, like a fucking legend in many different ways, was Tommy Chomp. I had him on nice. the show and yeah. like it didn't do great numbers, but to me, I love the episode. And it's like, I understand that's only going to appeal to certain people nowadays with everybody on the phone. Most people wouldn't have a fucking clue who Tommy Chong is. You got to get somebody around their forties and, and up, uh, probably yeah. know who he is. A few might here and there. Cause those, every now and again, those scenes will make a resurgence from like the up and smoke. But like, you yeah. know, I had him on, um, what's another, uh, good one. I had Tom Sizemore on now. Uh, he's passed away before that. But I mean, dude, fucking, he was a legend, man. I mean, he was in Heat, yeah. one of the greatest bank robbing movies ever, saving private yeah. mind. And all those things were just so very cool because I've never would have thought, like going through what I went through, that I would have been able to turn that experience into this. Cause make no mistake, had I not been charged with that and, and put on house arrest, I would have never started a podcast. I didn't even listen to podcasts. Like I had yeah. it was was wasn't even nothing I'd done. I started listening to him out of boredom and then it kind of grew. So to be able to flip that into something like this, and then now I just have a passion for it. I mean, I've talked with people. Sopranos is like my all time favorite TV show. I think you're a fan. I see it in the back of yeah. some of your videos. Sometimes I've interviewed like six or seven people from that show. Um, really? Yeah. I got a chance to interview David Praval who played Richie April in season two. Nice. Dude, so fucking awesome. I have a damn book that Christopher, who, they did a podcast tour as uh, Christopher and Bobby. Yeah, that, yeah t the, the two of them did a fucking tour. I met them both, and I got a signed book somewhere around here, but I'm not going to leave the awesome. camera here. I want to go. Somewhere in this they're doing another one, or they're, they're still touring right now, but they're supposed to be doing something in New Jersey around November. I'm going to try to get up there and see them, because I listened to that podcast, too, when they recapped all the episodes. I mean, I love that yeah. show. That was like church in my house on Sunday. Well, dude, here's why it was so funny, though. So so the Baja Mars, this casino in uh, the Bahamas, they, they, they worked. So, so they're going on this tour talking about their damn book and their podcast and shit and uh, doing a Q&A with the audience. Well, dude, they're doing it in places like the fucking Madison Square Garden. Well, they happen to do something in the Bahamas and they just invite the high rollers to this fucking thing, dude. There's only like 50 of us in the room, dude. They're up there doing this shit that they're usually doing for 20,000 people. They're doing it for 50 of us. So, dude, I asked like eight fucking questions. And it's like, like event, it was, dude, it was literally me, Evander Holyfield. Evander Holyfield is like, has this big, I don't know if those are all his kids or what. They had like 20 people with them from various ages. I'm assuming they're all his kids and grandkids. 
Um, and then like a handful of other people and then a bunch of Bahamians that just were like local because they couldn't fill the fucking room. They did it a weird night, dude, and they didn't really advertise it properly. So um, it was the coolest experience, dude. I hung out with them for a while, but that was one of the one of those fucking kind of cool, yeah. cool moments, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that, that show was just so landmark. You know, it, it'll always stand the test of time. I tell everybody, like, outside of the technology in that show, like flip phones yeah. and, and big ass computers, if that show come on today, it would still do yeah. great because of the so, storyline so, and the writing. Yeah. You, you know, you said something earlier. You, you, you mentioned how you, you the Tony Chung interview didn't do huge, huge numbers. And one of the things I've learned from my podcast, bro, is that there's these people that are like these traditional celebrities in that traditional realm. Right. And like, like for me, okay. I've had like for my podcast, I had Johnny Damon on there. I had um, Jamie Kennedy that you mentioned. I had the dude from the black guy from Cypress Hill on there, dude. Yep. Fucking cool. It's like send dog. Dude, I'm so fucking pumped up about these episodes, dude. I'm, but in social media world right now, they're not ultra popular. You know right. what I'm saying? And, and, and the numbers just aren't great. But those are maybe the episodes that I'm the most proud of, dude. I'm fucking, dude. Listen, man, we ain't fucking making a million bucks doing these podcasts, bro. Maybe you right. are. I ain't. No, but no, like, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> exactly. No, no one is, dude, except Joe Rogan, really, right? It's yeah. like not, not very many. Let's put it that way, dude. You, yeah, it's, it's very limited. People have this misconception because they'll say, "Oh, you must be making a lot of money with that podcast," and I'm like, "No, not not really." I was like, "I promise yeah. you, I, it's one of them things where I'm not lying. I do it because I like it because the the right. return isn't there." But now what I do, what I will say, what it's doing is it's laying groundwork and it's making connections that I think I can build into something because I've went from, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anybody. I meet this person. I meet this person. I meet that person to a couple of months ago. I just went out to California and was on Michael Francis's program. Who's got over a million followers on his channel. He just oh. interviewed up the Tate brothers. So like nice. that's what it's done. It's, it's building up to a point to where I can, but as far as like right now, no, but that's where I'm. I don't want to be good. I want to be great. You know what I'm saying? Good. Well, dude, and also, yeah, man. Like honestly, bro. Like at the end of the day, unless like Spotify picks you up or something, you got you got to get it by getting brand deals and sponsors. And and the only way to do that is by picking up the phone. So, like, like, like I I just look at it as an asset, bro. Like, like, yeah. dude. I, me and Sun Dog spending an hour together talking about 1990s Cypress Hill music, dude. I'm like a freaking little kid, bro. You kidding yeah. me? I don't give well, a, yeah. I don't give a shit if the, I don't give a shit if the numbers weren't great that episode, dude. Who gives a fuck if they were? What really changes if it was? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like seriously, especially right now with my social media too. It's like, dude, I put something up there that's fucking nine million motherfucking views, dude. I get nine million fucking listens to my podcast, dude. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? It's yeah. like. But it, but it means okay. something to you. Like you said, that was a, a music you grew up on. So that was, to you, that was exciting. That was kind of the same thing to me with some of these soprano guys and, and yeah. Tommy Chong. To me, it was exciting. And I wouldn't trade those interviews for nothing in the world. Some of them I don't get. I don't, like, they're, the numbers are crazy. And some of them I get why. But some of them I'm just like, I don't really get the appeal. But, I mean, I appreciate everybody that, that listens. But, like, ones yeah. I think would do great. Maybe it's just because me and my age, you know, I'm, I'm always going to be partial to those things. There's certain stars friends there was a whole horror movie i used to love called night of the demons and it's basically about a bunch mm -hmm. of fucking kids go party and they get taken over by demons and your typical 80s horror movie but i had like the the main character from there on and that was just like the coolest thing ever to me and my wife's like you know there's like going to be 10 people that know who that is and i'm like start with there's probably going to be 20 but it doesn't fucking matter i know who it is. <laughs> exactly dude Dude, I would, uh, yeah, man. No, we're speaking the same language, man. I, I was never a weed guy, but you got you got to have respect for Tommy Chung, and then Tommy oh, yeah. Chung also being cellmates with uh, Jordan Belfort. Jordan yeah, Belfort, he talked about that. that, helping him write his yeah. book, and he was like, mm -hmm. he said he would come to him with like two or three pages and and give them to him, and he's like, yeah, and written shit. He's like, come back with me when you got something. He's like, I'll give you a yeah. piece of advice. He's like, you got to make everything the most of. He's like, that was his yeah. rule, the most of rule. He's like, so if you're driving fast, that was the fastest you've ever been in your life. If, if you were okay. high, that was the highest you've ever been in your life. And I'm like, well, he listened to you. If you watch that fucking movie, like, he was high as shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's your well, dude, yeah, but then they even call themselves out as the narrator when uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is like, okay. Maybe the fucking helicopter, what was it? The helicopter like blows up in the sky or something by lightning. Maybe that didn't happen exactly right then, but same idea. <laughs> yeah. And he said, like, when he finished, he had to, like, drive by his house and yell, like, out from the road because they couldn't have that contact 
you know, because they're both technically felons. They couldn't be in contact with each other. So he was like yelling from the road, hey, the movie's coming out. I got it made, yada, yada. But they were like going back and forth. But yeah, those conversations ever, to me are cool. You ever see that opening, the opening scene in Wolf of Wall Street when he's doing, uh, like blowing, blow up the girls? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A buddy of mine, uh, or a guy I know, this one guy told me once, anyway, <laughs> he, he got it mixed up. He thought he was doing it out of her instead of blowing it. He's like, it, 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 there was like this argument. So did you do that to girls? Go, yeah, I always thought I was fucking weird. I go, yeah, it is fucking weird, dude. Because I saw the Wolf of Wall Street. No, <laughs> it's not what's happening, you fucking weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to look a little deeper there. Look, look a little deeper. Yeah, play in slow motion, pal. <laughs> Well, John, I've had a blast having you on, man. I guess we'll close out with this question. Like, I hear you right say on. all the time, like, if you want something, you got to go for it or whatever. I feel like the majority of the masses, and you've kind of broken this down. You're like, if you're doing good, say you got married, you got a house, you're renting out, you got a little bit of income coming in. That's not going to make you, like, rich. It might make you look comfortable. It's not going to make you rich. Do you feel like that the majority of America is okay with being comfortable, and that's why there's not enough people going after this? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. I, I think what just happens is that people realize that what they, at a point in their life where they think it's too late. Okay. Where they actually do the math when they're, you know, whatever it is, let's, let's call it 35, but it could be 55. It could be 25. Whenever they stop and do the math and they're like, Oh wait, that two flat that I bought in the city that I rent out now. And then me and my wife got married and moved to the suburbs. Oh, wait, that's not going to make me $10 million. It's going to make me some side income. Okay, shit. What else do I really got going on here? Well, I got my W-2 position and I get cost of living increases each year. And if I get the manager, I'm going to get a 15% bump that year. And But then it's cost of living increases again. And then they actually start to do the math. And then they figure out that those dreams that they had when they were 20 years old and all these big plans for that second home in Malibu and all this shit they were going to do with their life, they're not going to attain that in the financial position that they're in. So unfortunately, what people end up doing is changing the goal of their destination mm -hmm. rather than changing the journey. And what they should be doing, fuck that, dude. Just because you're fucking 30 now and you did the math, you're the same person that you were when you were 20. And guess what, motherfucker? You're still young. And I don't give a fuck if you're 50 when you figure this out. Change the path instead of the fucking destination itself, dude. And uh, the only way to do that really and build wealth to achieve those things, assuming that's your goal. And God bless all you people that, that don't care about stuff like that. I don't know why the fuck you're listening to us an hour into the show if you don't care about money at this point. But but most people do, man. And, um, and uh, you know, the only really way to, to access that wealth is to control your own destiny by being your own boss. There are no cost of living increases then. Okay. Yep. And when you're W2 employee, you, you retire and, and then it's by hope you hopefully you saved enough money. When you're an entrepreneur, you retire and you hopefully get a big pile of money granted to you from the company you just sold. There you have it, folks. Go follow and tell everybody where you can, uh, where they can follow you on Instagram. Also your YouTube channel. We'll also put links to all of that in the comments as well as your book. Yeah, man. At John Sarasani is my Instagram. That's where most of the action's at. That's where I'm at. At John Sarasani on TikTok as well. I don't, I'm not really paying attention to that, but it's the good content though. Same content as Instagram. I'm just not personally in there. Um, at John Sarasani TV is my YouTube station and I'm just starting to grow that thing. I got a TV show, reality show that I put on there called The Partner where I'm out there looking for business partners and that's up right now and we're about to just finish the first season of that. So check that out. And then um, my books on Amazon, 2000% raise. You can also just check out 2000%raise.com and stay connected, get on my email list. I do a lot of meetups and dinners and fun shit, man. Yeah, cool. Maybe we'll get together sometime. That uh, The show you got on YouTube kind of reminds me of like a new age, like apprentice with Donald Trump or something like that. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And 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 uh, thank you for letting me bring in some new kind. Very seldom do I get to talk about Cloaker University on one of these podcasts, bro. Yeah, right. Right, right around the corner from it, man. 
Right well, I'm going to tell you right now, Dar Darlington Speedway, bro, they would they would, um, they would would schedule their graduation each year based on when Darlington was doing their races. Race, because yep. if it was the same fucking weekend, there wouldn't be any hotel rooms for the damn parents. So they'd yeah. always have to coordinate that. I, so. I live like where the racetrack is. I live like right behind the track. So that little town of Darlington, South Carolina, for those three or four days when that race come, I mean, it was mm -hmm. just like there was no better place to be. Just the atmosphere that brought all the people, and and it was fun. But yeah, I, I'm very familiar with Coker. I was a, uh, I never went there, but I, I actually know one of the ladies that still works over there. She works in the office over there. But yeah, that, that's cool. cool. Man. I didn't even realize that connection was made there. So yeah, never know what you're gonna hear on these things. Um, right on. Hopefully, one day my travels will take me to Chicago, man. If I do, we'll have to get together for sure. For sure, man. Look me up, brother. Appreciate you, Hollywood. All right, buddy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Hollywood Wade. That was John Sarasani. And unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm going to tell you right here, if you're not listening to anything on this show, go follow his damn Instagram. It is highly entertaining. We'll see you next week on Crime and Entertainment. John, we appreciate you, my friend. Thank you.